Okay, we're going to start out this morning in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. I want you to get that in one hand. Galatians 5, 22. And then in your other hand, when you get there, go over to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 9. Just keep one hand in each of the two things there. Now, if you heard last week's sermon, I said that this week I'm going to be talking about the fruits of of the Spirit. Well, I'm not going to be talking about the fruits of the Spirit because that's not a Bible term. I was corrected this week. Thank you. The fact of the matter is, the Bible does not say fruits of the Spirit. And the thing is, I actually checked a couple new versions this morning, the, the newest NIV, the New American Standard, the New King James, even looked at the message. All of them say fruit of the Spirit. Kind of an interesting thing. We're going to see about that today. But look there in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. It says here, but the fruit of the Spirit. See it there? Look over at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 9. For the fruit of the Spirit. Do you see an S behind fruit in either passage? No. And that these two passages, Galatians 5.22, Ephesians 5.9, that's the only time that the term fruit of the Spirit shows up. Neither time does it say fruits, plural. Okay, now we're going to do a little English lesson here. When you have a singular word, like fruit, and you have the in front of a singular word, the the is the definitive article. It's defining what follows it. Okay, so when you have the fruit... It cannot be referring to more than one. Okay? It's defining a singular word. That's the way it is. Now, a lot of people say, but yeah, but there's nine fruits of the Spirit right there in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. No, there are not nine fruits of the Spirit. There are nine characteristics of the one fruit, which is what we're going to look at today. Now, if you'll notice there in Galatians... It talks about the characteristics of the fruit. You have the different the uh, characteristics listed there, which we're going to look at in detail today. Now, if you look over at Ephesians, notice it says the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So over here in Galatians, you have the characteristics of the fruit. Ephesians, you have where the fruit is found. Okay, the location of the fruit. What you find it in. The fruit is in these things. Okay, and we're going to look at this stuff in detail as we get on through this. Now, I'm going to illustrate a point here. I have here two different apples. Okay? This one here in my right hand is a very nice apple. Okay, the collar is almost perfect. The shape's almost perfect. The texture, it's nice and firm, nice and smooth. This thing over here is kind of pathetic. <laughs> It's about half the size. It's a little tiny thing, a little bit bigger than a crab apple. I mean, it's a little sickly looking apple. It's kind of crooked and whatever else. But now here's the, here's the point I want to make. This is one fruit, but it has a lot of different characteristics to it. Okay, now if you went to a county fair or someplace like that, and you wanted to, to show off an apple from your orchard, your prize apple, the judge wouldn't just go over and say, oh, it's a nice apple. They would, they would have different standards to, to, to determine the quality of the apple. Size, weight, uh, texture, collar, whatever, and taste, you know, would be another factor in determining the quality of your apple. Okay? So you couldn't just say that this is just an apple. There's characteristics to it. And in the same way, the fruit of the Spirit has different characteristics to it. And we're going to be looking at that today in this study. Uh, it's kind of interesting because I think part of the problem that people come up with is they look at these different characteristics here in, in verses 22 and 23, and they say, well, you know, my uh, spiritual tree, which we'll be looking at that too, my spiritual tree is producing uh, a good crop of love and joy and peace, but the Meekness, temperance, well, I didn't do too good on that this year. I'll have to work on that. Uh, no, those aren't different fruits. It's all supposed to be there. Okay? Now, you take these two different fruits right here. 
Well, they're the same kind of fruit, but this one, the characteristics are a lot more clear than this one over here, this little one. Okay, and that can be as a result of a couple different things. Okay, first of all, this apple here comes from a good mature tree. That's a healthy tree. This one here can come from a sickly tree or from a young tree. That's one thing you have to keep in mind as a Christian. You have to have grace for new believers. If you have a little sapling, a little brand new apple tree that you just planted, don't expect to get an apple like that. It's going to take a couple years. Okay, now, how do you get the tree, though, to produce a good apple? Well, there's a lot of different things. Uh, you have to fertilize it. It has to be fed. It has to get plenty of sunlight. It has to be pruned. We'll get to that later, too. A lot of stuff coming later. And it has to have plenty of water. We'll see about that in a little bit, too. And it's interesting, another thing about an apple tree. Right out there, out the window here, we have a lot of trees. But you know, none of them produce apples. It takes a special kind of a tree. You can't just say, oh, there's a tree, it must produce fruit. No, the tree is known by its fruit. Okay? And the interesting thing is, we have forest trees out here. And they have a different type of a... They grow differently than a field type of a tree. You don't see many forests that have apple trees in them. An apple tree requires good open spaces. And one of the characteristics that you'll see with an ap apple tree in the open, or any field type of tree, they have much stronger roots than a forest tree. Because, you see, a forest tree, they're all kind of... They all protect each other from the wind. But a tree that's out in the field... They'll actually have to have, you'll look at the, the base of a tree out here. It's kind of straight, kind of goes down, tapers a little bit. But a field tree, they really taper. And there's roots a lot of times are above the ground before they go down in. And they'll be big, thick roots. And you know how they get that big? By being knocked around and blown around. If you have a field tree, if you have an apple tree, and you put you stakes around it and special ropes going to it and all that, and just protect it and never let it go through any hard times, that tree, when it gets older, a windstorm comes along, it'll knock it right over. It has to have its roots developed by being blown around, by going through storms. A lot of analogies you can make there, but we'll continue on. Now look at uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. It says here, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led, led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. The problem that I have with the modern churches, the biggest problem, is that they, most of them, are led by the flesh and not by the spirit. You say, well, why do you guys play the rock music there? Well, I like it. Yeah, it's fleshly. All right, I'm going to be doing a study on music coming up here when I get the thing done. It's going to be a lot of work, but I'm putting a music or a yeah music message together. But rock music, rap, heavy metal, it's primarily focused on rhythm. Okay, rhythm appeals to the flesh. You say, well, I don't know about that. Okay, I can prove it to you. Get a bunch of little kids together, little babies together, and start putting a lot of drums beaten and stuff like that you won't see them sit there and get calm and, and listen they'll move their little bodies yeah. they'll they'll move all around yeah. you know play drum music and watch what happens to people the flesh will start to move it's a it's a it's a fact of science it's demonstrable it's observable it's testable amen okay that's what it is and what you have with these modern churches they can they confuse this issue right here and they say that the flesh and the spirit can work together you know and you see these people and they're and they're getting all into the music and they're closing their eyes and putting their hands up you know and stuff why because their flesh is being fed it's not the spirit the spirit is contrary to the flesh and you'll notice that if you ever go out tracting or soul winning or witness to people your flesh won't enjoy it your flesh will your flesh will be trying to come up with reasons to not do it and and oh well i you know i, I kind of feel sick all of a sudden i don't think i can witness it you know 
Why? Because your flesh is contrary to the Spirit. You can't bring the two together. Don't ever be deceived into thinking that. Okay? You see, the Bible's about division. Amen. Right? Right division. You rightly divide the Scriptures and you also rightly divide your own body. Alright? You cannot make your flesh and your spirit work together. It doesn't happen. And these modern Christians that say, oh, you know, I think we can. Well, that's because your flesh has taken over a long time ago and the Spirit's not in control. And you're just deceiving yourself thinking that the Spirit's in control when He's not. <clears throat> but now we're going to see about the works of the flesh. Galatians 5.19. Jump down there quick. It says here, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Now let me just stop there for just a second. They're manifest. What's that mean? Well, if something is manifest, you can see it. So this isn't like adultery? I've never seen adultery before. Fornication? What's fornication? I can't see that anywhere in our society. No, it's not what it is. They're manifest. They're everywhere you can look. Turn on the TV and you'll, you can watch the whole list there in about a half hour. You could just go, yep, check, you know, fornication, yep, check, uncleanness, check, you know, go down through the list. They're manifest. Continuing here. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which, which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I've heard a lot of people exposit this, and they say, you see, if you're doing anything in that list there, you're not going to go to heaven. That's what they say. Well, let me tell you something. If that was true, and it's not, if it was true, there wouldn't be anybody in heaven. <laughs> okay? At some point in time, you're going to fall for one of these things in here. So I, I'd never murder anybody or be drunk or adultery or fornication or, or idolatry or witchcraft. What about hatred? What about variance? Having strife and things among the brethren? <laughs> oh, there's none of that around, you know. What about emulation? I'm the reverend doctor. You know? Yeah. Emulations. What about wrath? Anybody ever make you so mad that you had wrath towards them? See, you're going to get hit by one of those things in that list. Okay, we have another message on that. Uh, the flesh versus the spirit, I guess. Dual what was it called? Dual nature of the flesh. That's what it is been so long since I preached that one. So what is the kingdom of God? We're going to hit this quick. Uh, we're not going to go to these verses. I'm just going to zip down through them because we have a bunch of other things to turn to today. But uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21, it says here, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Romans 14.17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So the kingdom of God, the main definition in Scripture, is spiritual fellowship between God and His children. I'm going to talk more about that in just a second here. But now I'm going to be honest with you. I looked up all the references and there is one time that I was able to find, there's one time when the kingdom of God is a reference to the millennial kingdom. Okay? Luke chapter 13, verse 28 and 29 says, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down <clears throat> in the kingdom of God. Okay? So there is one reference there where it is a reference to the millennial kingdom. And you compare that to Matthew chapter 8, verse 11 through 12, and that same thing is given, but this time it says kingdom of heaven. So there is a time there where it is a reference to the millennial kingdom. So you have there, first of all, the kingdom of God that you don't inherit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, is spiritual fellowship between yourself and the Lord. The second one is the millennial kingdom. Reign in the millennial kingdom. If you're messing around with the lust of the flesh. And we're going to see about that in just a second here. But there's one thing that you can be sure of. 
The kingdom of God in Galatians 5.22 is not a reference to heaven. That's one thing that it isn't. So rest assured, you're not going to lose your salvation if you're messing around with the lust of the flesh there. You say, oh, then I can mess around with it. Well, if you want to lose fellowship with the Lord and you want to lose your millennial inheritance, yeah, go ahead. Have at it. You know, not a good idea. Um, now, if you live in sin and you fulfill the lust of the flesh, the spiritual fellowship that, there that I mentioned, the way to, or another verse on that, it says there in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And you say, well, I've, I've done some things there in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. What should I do about it? And I was saying verse 22. It's verse 21, by the way. Uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, it's kind of interesting, just another point I want to illustrate here. If you have children, or you're around children, and you're having fun, and you're having a good time, and and it's... It's a neat thing, and all of a sudden they do something that's wrong. You can't keep going on having fun. You have to stop and you have to say, "Now you know you're not allowed to do that." You know, and you know I'm an uncle, so I I don't really you know spank them or anything. But I say, you know, if you do that again, I'm gonna, we're going to have to tell mommy and daddy about that. But if you're a parent, you know it's you know we're having a good time here playing and whatever, and then they do something, they disobey. Well. Time to get a spanking. Whatever. It's the same thing with the Lord. There's a lot of times when we're doing good and we're having a good time of fellowship with the Lord and we do something stupid, the Lord just can't go, oh, wow, you know, no big deal. He has to punish. Don't be deceived into thinking that God's not going to punish you for your sin. Okay, you aren't going to lose your salvation, but you're going to lose that fellowship. Okay? But fellowship is restored when you confess your sins. And when you forsake it. Okay? It isn't just enough to confess it and then just do it again. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You have to show the Lord that you've truly repented of that thing. Uh, what about the millennial rewards? I'll give you a couple verses here quick. Second Timothy chapter two, verse eleven through thirteen says, It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him we shall also live with him. If we suffer we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So the denying there is denying millennial rule, millennial inheritance. Okay, You're not going to get what's coming to you, basically. And there again, a lot of times you have a parent that buys something nice for their child, just as kind of a reward, and then their child does something really bad, really stupid, and you have to kind of say, well, I can't give it to him right now. See? Our Heavenly Father is the same way. That's what's going on there in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Okay, don't let anybody deceive you into thinking that you're going to lose your salvation based on those verses. You're not. Now let's look at uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Here we're going to get into the fruit of the Spirit. It says here, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. All right, so you see there the nine characteristics. Now we're going to look at each one in detail. First John chapter four. The first fruit, or the first characteristic, I should say. Uh, first characteristic of the fruit of the spirit is love. First John chapter four, verse seven. <clears throat> It says here, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. For this was manif in this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. 
Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed that love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in him dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, perfect, uh, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Now, I want to ask a couple questions. Did you see anything, any references in there to loving, unsaved, Christ-rejecting sinners? No. No. Did you see anything in there about God loving them? No. 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 Well, you know, doesn't it say that God loved the world? Yes, it does. Loved. Loved past. Past tense. Okay, God's love was manifest at Calvary. You see it right there. Uh, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. You know, that's where the love was manifested, at Calvary. You're not going to find it if you reject Jesus Christ. And God's love, the love that, that He shows to us, we're also to have for the brethren. Okay? That's supposed to be there. You don't have to get along with them, but you have to love them. Okay, and we're going to see about that here as we continue. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Practice that's becoming more and more common in these modern churches. They'll take verses that talk about love, and they'll put them out there for the lost world. That's a lie. You're deceiving people. The Bible doesn't teach that. You can listen to our, our message of uh, does God love lost sinners? If you want more information on that. But now we're going to look here at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Okay, it says this, That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, I want you to notice something there. People, they'll, they'll put this on you a lot. You know, I say, you know, the NIVs of the devil. Oh, man, you, you need to be more loving. And what does more loving mean? It means that I should not tell the truth. Right. See? But if you look there in verse 14, it says that we're not to be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You know? Well, I used the, the New American Standard Version until the English Standard Version came out, and that one's more accurate than the NASV, and then the NIV 2011 came out, and that's even better, and so this is the closest to the Greek, and this is, and then I checked the Greek text, and this one, what are you doing? You're a child. You're being tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Okay? And, and who's doing it there? By the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Why are they doing that? Money. I mean, you have the King James Bibles has been printed in, into over, I think it's over 9 billion or something right now, you know, since 1611. I mean, you think about that and you say, hmm, if I could sell a Bible, if I could sell 500 million of them, it's a lot of money. It's a whole lot of money. So what you do is you get your Bible to be printed by secular companies that use secular slogans like the number one Bible, the most trusted, the most accurate. They're all the most accurate and the most trusted. I mean, look at the look at the stuff that they put out on it. You know, it's ridiculous. And what are you doing? Well, as a child, you're being tossed about. And so there you see deception in verse 14. Watch out for the deception. Verse 15, it says, speak the truth in love. Why do you think I'm putting videos together exposing these new versions? You know, I have better things I could be doing with my time. Why am I doing it? Well, because it's out of love for people. And it's kind of like if I see a rattlesnake overcoiled up in the corner, I'm not going to go, oh, isn't that nice? You know, 
I now I don't totally agree with everything a rattlesnake does, but I mean, no, I'm going to say there's a rattlesnake, you know, and if and if it's not too dangerous of a situation, I'm going to, you know, probably pull a gun out and shoot it or something, or go over and kill the thing, you know. The new versions are rattlesnakes. They attack the Lord Jesus Christ. Rock music is a rattlesnake. There's a lot of things that are evil. And when I come out and I attack it, of course I'm going to have a little bit of passion. Of course I'm going to be saying some things that are nasty. You know, because I'm trying to warn people. That's called love. If you have a child and your child is going to go do something dangerous, you don't go, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, you don't do that. You yell, hey, stop. Don't touch that. You know, bad idea. That's what you do. That's what we're supposed to do as Christians. And that is speaking the truth in love. I mean, read the words of Jesus. It's crazy. But now we're going to look at joy. And you say, joy is when things go go your way, right? Wrong. Second Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to show you the greatest definition of joy in the Bible for a Christian. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse uh, 1. I'm going to read down to verse 3. This is an amazing thing right here. Okay, it says here, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Remember what I said last week about what a church is? It's the people. Uh, verse 2, How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy... And their deep riches, doesn't say riches, it says poverty. And their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. Now when you have the Apostle Paul saying, I bear record to the power of these people. That's something. Especially when he's writing to the Corinthians, you know. Because he's blasting them all the time because they're very carnal. But notice there in verse 2, they had deep poverty, but it abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Even though they were very poor, they were giving everything that they had to the work of Jesus Christ. And what did they have as a result? Joy. You see, joy isn't based on getting a new car, getting a new house, things going good. New job, making lots of money, perfect health. That's not joy. That's happiness. Happiness can go away. Joy you should have, you should keep that as a Christian. I mean, think about it. When you die, you're going to go live forever in a perfect body that doesn't sin, that never gets sick, no more crying. Shouldn't you have joy? And I'll tell you what, around here we have people, and you know, going to rip on them again, tough. We have whole groups of people around here, the black bumper Mennonites. They drive black vehicles, and they wear mostly black. And most of those people, it looks like they live on a dot, you know, that their diet is, is lemons or something. I mean, they, they're just, everywhere they go, just frowning and just, you know, you say hi to them, hi. You know, it's like... <laughs> Shouldn't you be projecting a little bit more joy here? You know? But there's a there's a saw shop I go to occasionally, and there's a Mennonite guy that works there, and that guy is the epitome of Christian joy. I'll tell you what. I don't think I ever saw him not smiling. I mean, just amazing. Just the friendliest guy. Just the nicest. Um, man, it's incredible. You know? That's the way it's supposed to be as a Christian. We're supposed to have joy. You know? And if you want to remember a little thing here, a good secret to having joy is... To spell the word joy, J stands for Jesus first, O for others second, and Y for yourself last. And if you put Jesus first and others second and yourself last, you'll have joy. Now we're going to look at peace. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9 is where we're going to go next. Kind of funny, the, the big thing in the hippie culture was peace. Peace, man. Yeah, and they didn't have it. They were trying to find peace in drugs and fornication and, and rock music. You're not going to find it there. Okay, and worshiping nature. Definitely not going to find it there either. 
Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. It says here, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, you can have peace as a Christian in a camp someplace being tortured. And people can look, you know, you read the stories of the martyrs, and it's like these guys had peace, and the torturers are, you know, are going, I don't understand this. Why? Well, it's the peace that passeth understanding. How can you have peace when things are so horrible in the world, when things are going crazy? Because I'm saved. I know I'm saved. It passes understanding. The lost world can't understand how we can have peace. But continuing here, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true... See what it starts out with? <laughs> true. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. You know, a lot of people think it'd be depressing to be constantly studying the truth. And I'll tell you what, at first, when you really, you know, first take a look at everything that's going on and you see how rotten the world really is, it can get you down a little bit. But after you get past that initial shock of getting through, cutting through the, the fake veneer of that is America, you know, and a lot of other countries too, once you get through that and you start to see the Bible's true, I'll tell you what, it's an extremely peaceful thing. And you can have joy in the midst of understanding what's going on in the world. Okay? And you're to think on things that are true, by the way. Not on lies. Isaiah 57.21 says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. I know of rich people that all that they do is go on vacations and buy new cars and build bigger houses and do this and do that and do that. Why? They don't have peace. And they think that they can find peace it's just around the corner. And if I just go to this new place, or if I just buy that car, then I'll have peace. And they get it, and they have happiness, but they don't have joy, and they don't have peace as a result. And, you know, these people, these guys too I mentioned earlier, you know, the hippies and stuff that do the drugs and everything, they say, oh man, it was so good, you know, I was tripped out and all this stuff. Yeah, but what happened afterwards? When you come crashing back down to the earth again. When you wake up laying in your own vomit or something, you know, hey, <laughs> you know, you found peace there. All right, now the fourth one, long suffering, the fourth characteristic of the fruit of the spirit. Go to Second Corinthians chapter six. You're going to see that the Bible, when you study it, when you really get into reading it and understanding it, you're going to see it's very contrary to what most modern Christians teach and believe. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4. You want to be approved as the minister of, of God? Here we go. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering. By kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report. Well, you're one of those King James only advocates. Amen. And good report. As deceivers and yet true. Notice that one. The world calls you a deceiver and yet you're telling the truth. That's what's going to happen. Verse 9. As unknown and yet well known, unknown by the world, unrespected by the world, disrespected by the world, I should say, but yet well known among the brethren. Okay? As dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Now, when you start to manifest all those different things there, when you start to experience all those different things, you know what it's going to take to get through all that? Long suffering. Patience is not the word that you want to replace long suffering with. Long suffering is not an archaic word. 
okay, you can see it manifesting itself, you know, when you start to live for the Lord. It's not a thing about patience. Okay, you can be, you can say, man, you know, I'm going to be getting a Corvette, a brand new Corvette at the end of the week. I have to be patient till then. You know, that's not long suffering. Okay, long suffering is you're getting attacked on a daily basis. You're, you know, you see something that bothers you, and you know, oh man, you know, you get, you know, in trouble and you have people yelling at you, and sometimes you get sick, whatever else. Long suffering. Yeah, that with no end in sight. Yeah. That's long suffering. Exactly, and no end in sight. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Not like, you know, well, pretty soon everybody's going to accept me and they're going to, you know, think I'm wonderful. No. <laughs> it's pretty much going to be rotten the rest of your life. <laughs> Get ready for it. And, you know, verse 5 might eventually come into play here in America. Stripes, imprisonments, tumults, labors, labor camps, you know. <laughs> That might come. I don't know. I can't guarantee it. Uh, we're not going to turn here, but I'll just read another verse. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So there you see long suffering. Now the next characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. Turn to Second Timothy chapter 2. And I just picked a couple verses here, by the way, too. I, we can't go over every single verse I try to get through uh, these studies as quick as I can because there's so many different things to cover so many different subjects people requesting and things I have a whole list of them so we're just going to hit a couple of verses today but here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 24 it says here and the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men apt to teach patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. A lot of people kind of hear some of the stuff I put out and they think I'm mean spirited and whatever else. I had a guy call me this or tell me this week that I'm I'm not even saved. I'm a hater, you know. And this guy, I was I was warning him about putting profanity on my channel, but he tells me that I'm not saved, you know. And he's trying to quote scripture at me and stuff, and I'm like. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> you know, but you know what I really wanted? I witnessed to the guy. I would have been tickled to death if he would have gotten saved. I wanted to teach him. I wanted to help the guy. You know, I came to him in meekness. I said, hey, you know, this is a Christian channel. There are kids that watch these videos. I don't want profanity on my channel. Please don't put it on there. I had to delete a couple of his comments. You know, I want to see the guy get saved. He didn't. You know, he didn't like the plain gospel being preached to him, and, and so that was it. But I came to him in a gentle way. And I had another guy this week contact me, and he said he didn't appreciate some of the things I was saying about the military in one of the messages. And I said, you know, if I, he said, because I respect soldiers, and it's not, you know, the soldiers, it's the government that's corrupt. And I said, okay. I said, I, you know, I didn't mean to come off attacking soldiers. The guy came to me in meekness, and I answered it in meekness, in a gentle way. You know, I respect that. And he did something else, too. He signed his full name at the end of his message. That's a big thing with me. You get these people, they attack you, and then they don't sign their name. Uh, you're a coward if you do that. You know, sign your name. If you want to rebuke me or whatever, okay, fine, I'll try to be gentle if you come in your, you know, come in a spirit of meekness. But we're to be gentle. Now we're going to go on to the next one here. Goodness. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Okay, Romans chapter 15, verse 13. It says here, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. And again, you cannot separate the truth from being good and gentle and loving and whatever else. You see it right there again. Filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another admonishing, exhorting, that's what we're supposed to do with the brethren. 
Okay, and how do you do it? With the truth. Come to them in a loving way and say, hey brother, I saw you're doing this and you know the Bible really says that or whatever. Admonish them. See, this whole modern movement of removing the truth, well, it does, truth doesn't matter. Let's just come together and, and just respect one another's feelings. That's not it. That's not how it's supposed to be. You're to come together with a, with a spirit of truth and believing in absolute truth. And if you see a brother that's not walking according to the truth of the Word of God, you come to him in meekness, in gentleness, and you try to do good to them. Goodness. Uh, number seven here, faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. This is probably the best definition of faith in your New Testament. That's why we're going to turn there. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Okay, it says here, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay? You're just going to have to have faith sometimes that the Lord will work things out for you. Look at verse 6. You say, well, I don't know if I can have faith. I have to see it. Well, then that's a problem. It says here, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay? You have to have faith. If you want more on the subject of faith, we're not going to go into too much more here for sake of time, but you can listen to the message, The Just Shall Live by Faith. Okay, you have to have faith. The eighth characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit is meekness. Turn to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 1. Okay, it says here, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be, brought, to be no brawlers, excuse me, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. All right, now, we've been over this in other studies, the whole thing of Romans chapter 13. It says that rulers are not a terror to good, but to the evil. The Bible defines the kind of rulers that you're supposed to be in submission to. Right now we have rulers in this country. You still do need to be careful how you talk about them. That is still a thing there. And you can't get an attitude, a chip on your shoulder because the government's corrupt and you see a police officer sitting along the road and he's got his little traffic gun or whatever, a stinking cop. Don't do that. You know, do the speed limit. Okay? That's the way it is. You're not to speak evil of those guys. All right? Is there corruption? Yes, there's corruption. Okay? But then there are some idiots out there too that in a 45 zone, they're doing 75. Mm -hmm. They are a danger to other people. Now, I want that police officer out there to nail people like that. Okay? And if you're doing 60 or 65 and he, he pulls you over, you don't go, oh, corrupt system. He's against my constitution. It said 45... Do 45. It's not, a, it's not a problem. Okay? That's not something that you should, you know, take a bold stand, you know. Come on. You know, don't get messed up in that stuff. But the point is, as a Christian, you are to be meek. All right? That doesn't mean you have to be a sissy or effeminate. doesn't mean that. But you have to have, show meekness to all men. You have to be gentle, apt to teach. That's the way it's supposed to be. All right. Uh, now we're going to go on to the ninth one here. Uh, temperance. Go to Acts chapter 24. There's a lot of very interesting stories in the Bible, and this is one of my favorite ones. Acts chapter 24, we're going to look at verse 24 and 25. We're going to see here a good uh, uh, kind of a funny thing on the subject of temperance. We're actually going to see not a good example of temperance, but a bad example of temperance. Okay, it says here in Acts 24, or, uh, yeah, 24, verse 24, And after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he, sa he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. 
<laughs> and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Now, if you do any kind of soul winning at all, you're going to experience that one. Well, I, yeah, I, I respect what you're saying, but I, I just don't know if I'm ready to get saved quite yet. You know, maybe we could talk about this again sometime. And you leave and they go, whew, man, you know, I'm glad they're gone. <laughs> you know, why? Well, think about something. Here you have this guy who's in royalty, basically, and Paul talks to him about righteousness. There are some righteous rulers out there. Yeah. What about temperance? Don't drink too much. Don't drink too little. Don't eat too much. Don't eat too little. Don't sleep too much. Don't sleep too little. Most royal royalty, people in royalty, they don't practice temperance. They want the best of everything. They want the finest foods. They want the biggest mansions, the whatever else. They don't practice temperance. And what follows there? Judgment to come. And Felix trembled. Because Felix... He's up there with his royal gowns on and his royal apparel and his you know, probably beautiful wife there and everything and they just got done eating a sumptuous meal and here's this shabby guy down there in handcuffs preaching to him. And Felix realizes, if I want to be like that, I'm going to be down there. You mean I'd have to give up my palace and my wealth and all my friends and my, you know, everything? Yeah, pretty much so. Ooh, well, uh, not right now. I'll, I'll talk to you later. And how much you want to bet that that later never came? Yeah. The Bible never records it, you know. But I can almost guarantee you that the I'll call for you in a convenient season. I can almost guarantee you the convenient season never came. Rarely ever does with those types of people. Now going back to Galatians, Galatians chapter five, verse twenty-three. So we've seen there the five, or the uh, excuse me, nine different characteristics of the fruit of the spirit. Galatians five twenty three, the end there it says, "Against such there is no law." Okay, a just society, a good society, will not pass laws against Bible believing Christians. Bible believing Christians are the types of people that you want as your citizens. You know, real ones. Yeah, real they ones. they work hard. They're good people, they're gentle, they're meek, they're obedient to the law. That's the kind of people that you want as your subjects, as your, as your citizens, whatever. Okay? And when you start having laws being passed against people that are doing good, you're not dealing with a just government anymore. You're dealing with a criminal government. And, you know, at that point, things change a little bit. I'm not saying to overthrow governments or anything like that. Don't get excited. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You know, you hear the thing about he talks the talk, but he doesn't walk the walk. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of Christians like that. They talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. Verse 26. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Okay, why? Well, up to verse 21, envyings. Verse 20, emulations. Those are lusts of the flesh. When you start to envy other people and try to you know, prove that you're a better Christian than other people, you know, you're running in, into some trouble there. Don't fall for the thing of emulation either, building yourself up. Uh... And next we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 5. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 8. So we saw the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. Now we're going to see where the fruit is found. Verse 8, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, Amen. and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Interesting. The unfruitful works of darkness. That's what the lost world produces. Okay? And if you want to manifest the 
proper characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit, it starts by doing good in all goodness and living righteously and walking in the truth. That's where the fruits of the Spirit, or the, excuse me, the fruit of the Spirit, those nine characteristics, they're going to be strong when you're doing those things. Now, in conclusion here, we're going to turn, I guess, one more place. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 43. Now, we talked earlier about the apple. Showed that thing. And uh, where's an apple come from? A tree. Yes, very good. You know, we'll put a gold star on your name on the calendar. Uh, <laughs> Luke chapter 6, verse 43. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. Isn't that interesting? A tree is not known by the somebody else's fruit. Known by your own fruit. Okay? Don't try to hide behind another Christian and say, well, you know, I'm a good person because I follow so-and-so. No, you're known by your own fruit. Continuing here. Verse 44, For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Okay, now if you're saved, you should be producing good fruit. And it's kind of interesting because if you remember what Jesus gave in type of, of dealing with Israel, Matthew chapter 21 verse 19 says, And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever, and presently the fig tree withered away. Make sure that you're producing fruit. Make sure that your tree, your body of flesh, make sure it isn't just leaves. Okay? There should be fruit on it, and the fruit should manifest all nine of those characteristics that we read earlier. Now, a couple questions here, and then we're done. What is the quality of the fruit that you bear? How are you doing with the fruit of the Spirit? Okay? If your fruit was judged using those, those nine characteristics, those nine different things, would you win first place, or would you barely qualify? Okay? What do you need to do to your tree to make better fruit? What did we talk about earlier? It needs to be fertilized. Okay? And that's going to be spiritual and physical, by the way. You need to have the right type of food to grow. Okay? You can have all the spiritual health in the world and be doing good spiritually. And if you're not taking care of, I mean, don't go overboard taking care of your flesh. You've got to keep that stuff in mind. Don't become a fitness fanatic and, and forsake the Word of God because you're so worried about your health. You're going to have a thorn in the flesh, okay, occasionally. That's going to be there, okay? And weakness is when you have strength. So be careful about the health thing. But the point is you need, do need, there is a thing there taking care of your health, okay? But it's spiritual and physical. You need to have the proper fertilizer. You also need sunlight, all right? You can spell that S-U-N, light, or S-O-N, like you need to be in fellowship with the Lord you need to be praying okay you need water the Bible talks about being sanctified and cleansed with the washing of the water by the word you need the proper Bible to be watered and you also need to be pruned are there things in your life that you need to cut out that's called sanctification when you go through and you start to read your Bible and you say oh boy wait a second this verse says that I'm not to be doing this and I'm doing it. Uh-oh. What's that? Well, if you ever see a fruit tree, occasionally you'll see this dead kind of gnarly branch coming out, you know, and it's not producing anything. And what's that thing doing? Well, it's drawing water out into that thing and it's just rotting. You know what the best thing is to do? Cut it. Prune it. And you have another branch and it's it's really kind of producing anemic fruit and, you know, you, you want to keep things pruned correctly if you have too many branches you know there's going to be too much going out there you just want to have a couple good branches 
that are producing good fruit. So you prune it back. You cut it back occasionally. And you say, well, I only have to do that one time to, to the tree, right? Nope. That's a yearly endeavor. You have to constantly examine yourself according to the Scriptures and repent of those things that you're doing wrong and cut them out of your life. Why? To produce healthier fruit. That's the way it is. And uh, it's kind of interesting too because your uh, flesh is basically the disease. It's like a, a disease in, your, in the tree, in the spiritual tree. Eventually it will kill the tree. And you say, what can I do to escape that? Nothing. Eventually your flesh is going to die. Okay, we're not incorruptible in these bodies. But you can fight that disease of the flesh. Remember what we read earlier. The flesh and the spirit are contrary to one to the other. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh. You put your flesh down and you lift the spirit up and feed the things that are spiritual, you'll produce better fruit. So, let's get busy making some good fruit for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's going to be the end of the message this morning. We'll close with a quick word of prayer here. Heavenly Father, I do thank You for the Your Word. And Lord, there's so many things that, that just even one little letter can change the whole meaning of a passage. And Your Word says the fruit of the Spirit, not fruits, plural. And I know a lot of Christians out there are just kind of going around and saying that they're spiritual tree is going to produce a good crop of love this year, but not much long-suffering. It's not supposed to be that way, Lord. The, the fruit that we're supposed to produce is supposed to have all nine of those characteristics in it. And I just pray, Lord, that those that are out there that can honestly say when looking at that list that they are having a hard time with meekness or goodness or gentleness, things like that, or long-suffering, I pray, Lord, that they would need to examine themselves and, and that they would prune out what needs to be cut out of their lives and uh, examine themselves according to the Scriptures and get them their lives straightened out and then go out there and start to live for you and, and uh, produce some real spiritual fruit in the time that we have left. And so I just pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.